Good morning. Ah, it yeah. works. Success. <laughs> <laughs> um, success. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on such a beautiful day inside. And uh, this is promises to be a, a fabulous conversation. These are four books that I've read and and loved. Um, so the topic for the day, Moments That Changed America. Um, defining moments changed America. They may be the two great overused phrases for book titles in America. Mm. Um, but there's nothing so, you know, oversold, overhyped, or overused in the books we'll talk about today. Um, two focus on tragedies in our lifetimes, um, death of Martin Luther King, the hurricane um, that debited, devastated so much of America, um, and two books about courtroom dramas with echoes, um, the Sacco and Vanzetti and the Dover, Pennsylvania um, case on intelligent de design, which was evocative, of course, of the scope monkey trials. These four books uh, deal with critical moments in the past where history could have turned out differently. Together, the books rearrange history in our heads. They dissemble myths and reconstruct narratives um, with an application um, from an array of unheard voices. This new chorus of voices kind of revises and rewrites stories um, we thought we knew, um, so adapting them um, with new revelations and, and deeper understanding. Today, we'll hear from each of our panelists and converse, but uh, open it up for questions. And we really uh, do want to make this sort of an, uh, an engagement and a conversation rather than a, a set of lectures. Um, and I sort of thought we would sort of cut through the swath of the 20th century and start at the beginning um, with Bruce Watson um, and his tale of execution um, 80 years ago. Um, with um, Sacco and, and Zetti, um, the men, the murders, and judgment of mankind. Um, Bruce writes about overlooked characters and episodes in history. Uh, his previous book um, was Bread and Roses, Mills, Migrants, and the Struggle for the American Dream. And uh, um, so Bruce, um, it's interesting that you, know, you have this sort of jazz era story, um, two Italian immigrants, and anarchists, and sort of but anybody who's sort of gone through high school, college, sort of vaguely knows about um, the trial, uh, the murder. But other than sort of the fact that they were sort of put to death with a shady trial, um, people sort of don't really know that much. Um, I'm wondering sort of how you could find new evidence and uh, to, to amplify this tale. Well, I when I started the topic, uh, I didn't think I was going to find that much new. I have to confess. Uh, I thought there was some new academic uh, research on Sacco and Manzetti that had found their anarchist background and had traced everything they had done basically in their lives up until the time they were arrested, and the book just stops there. But that was brand new, and it shed a rather interesting picture uh, on, on, these, on these men, because although during the time that they were, uh, became world, world famous, they were basically touted as pacifists and philosophical anarchists who, had, who would never harm a fly, and, and they were indeed very gentle men. Uh, that was that was sort of the line that went out. And uh, however, this uh, this historian Paul Averick, a historian of anarchism, had written this groundbreaking work in the 1990s, in which he said he revealed that they were not at all that way. That they were actually involved in a bombing campaign uh, in 1919, which was one of the moments I wanted to talk about that might have changed America. And so that book had, had come out, and no one quite knows, by the way, what they did in that campaign, but it, but it was all of their friends who were involved in, the, in this bombing of, in which mail bombs were mailed to John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and, and uh, the Attorney General and all sorts of other things. So I knew that was brand new. It had never been written into a narrative, and I thought, well, I'm going to, I sometimes see myself as a bridge between, uh, because I'm not a professional historian, I'm a writer, and I, and I don't have a PhD, and so I think, well, I wrote for Smithsonian Magazine for many years, and I was always conscious of the fact that there were people at the Smithsonian who 
were just vastly more educated than than anybody else on earth, and they all sort of looked at us at the magazine as popularizer just popularizers and but i I came to see myself as a bridge between the academic world of books that are not very often read and what I hope would be books that are actually read <laughs> and it's been it's a shaky bridge, I'll tell you, but um, in this case, again, I thought that I would, just as I did with my Bread and Roses story, which had been uh, in the la many labor histories, but there'd never been a book about it. In Sacco and Vanzetti, I knew there'd been many books about it, but none in a, in a while, and I thought, I will, I will make this bridge again, include the new, uh, the new stuff about their anarchist background, and, and retell the story that's been largely forgotten. And then, to my amazement, from really almost the first month when I went into the archives at the Boston Public Library, I discovered all sorts of things that had never been, been written uh, about. It's just such a vast case. So I read all of their letters, including in Italian. Uh, I don't know that anyone had done that before. And I read their lawyers' letters and discovered all sorts of, of uh, intrigue behind the scenes. And I found at, at Harvard uh, certain trial transcripts during the, during the whole ordeal that they both underwent, Sacco had been, Sacco had been uh, institutionalized for, you could call it paranoia, but you might also call it uh, common sense given what was happening to him. <laughs> and I found there, that was, that of course had been reported, but no one had ever found the, the entire uh, transcript of three days of private hearings, they were never reported uh, on in the press, uh, of what people were saying about his condition. And from that I found all sorts of information about his life in jail and how he had confronted his wife and even accused her of trying to hurt him. And, and uh, then I found there was another instance of, of a truly bizarre moment in which uh, in which the gun barrel on Sacco's gun, which is very instrumental, the gun, was in, um, in his conviction, was found to have been switched by someone. Again, this was known and this was reported on, but only from the point of view of the judge, about whom I could speak for hours, uh, only from his summa summary of, the, of, again, private hearings that were held uh, for which I found the transcript. And so there was, there was just an abundant amount of information that I found that, that no one had done before. And yet I think what was the even more different was what I tried to do was to tell the story as it happened and to tell it not from the point of view of they were absolutely 100% innocent or they were absolutely 100% guilty, because although I certainly have my point of view, I don't state it in the book. And I think that that's not just a, a tactic that gets people to read on, but it's the way history happens. There are no terribly black or white issues. There are not very many, anyway, uh, times when we're absolutely certain of what happened. And in 1923, for example, the American, or 1927, the American public didn't know. They weren't certain. Uh, some, some people were absolutely certain of their innocence, some of their guilt, but there was, there was all sorts of doubt. And so I tried to include in the, in the narrative all of the doubts, all of the evidence for their guilt, all of the evidence I could find for their innocence, and to let you, the reader, decide. And I, I think that readers are intelligent enough to make up their own minds, and that had never been done. And I, I, I tell you, I read all of the books on Sacco and Manzetti, and some of them are, were heavy going because from the first page you're told what to think, basically. And uh, I didn't want to do that, so, so I felt that even if I didn't have any new evidence, that would, that would, have, been, uh, that would have been something new. And I, I wish more history books did that. Thanks. Um. Um, well, moving on through the 20th century to 1968, um, Michael Dyson, um, you were, I did say you'd be third, but I did, got my dates wrong. Um, but, um, didn't realize I, you know, how young you were. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, but you were in grade school when Martin Luther King was goods killed. Um, and in your book, Martin Luther King's Death and How It Changed America, you explore how King used his speeches and to shape his legacy. Um, and now, 40 years later, um, his messages changed to fit the agendas of different decision makers. And one phrase that I thought was a, a moment for your book was, um, whites wanted him clawless, blacks wanted him flawless. Mm. Can you sort of speak to that? Yes, ma'am. Well, it's good to be here. And uh, 
have this opportunity to sit with these extraordinary authors. Um, and I've watched all of your films. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> all right.